Hello, my name is Andrew Hamill, and today I'm going to walk you through getting set up with Raylib on Windows. I'm going to give you a quick tour of a few of the foundational features, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why you might want to use Raylib, why it's worthwhile to learn, and some of the biggest reasons that it's my favorite thing to talk about, basically. Basically my favorite thing when it comes to programming and game design. So what is Raylib? Well, Raylib is a graphics framework. It's a library that is actually written in C for the C99 standard that is going to allow us to draw textures to the screen as well as drawing primitives. It also has some other really important features such as audio management so we can actually play sounds and stream music through the app. And ultimately, it's going to have a bunch of other features that I'm always going to forget about. It's actually capable of 2D, which is typically what I use it for, but it also can do 3D with full mesh and material loading as well as stereoscopic rendering for VR. It has built-in VR support. Now, I haven't used the VR or 3D very much. I have every intention to learn it in the future, but it's just not something that I have devoted much time to. By trade, I'm actually a professional C-sharp developer, so I'm usually using Unity for this kind of stuff, but it's definitely something I'm interested in learning in the future. Raylib is also entirely open source, which means it's totally free for commercial, personal, educational, whatever. It's all up to you. You can do whatever the heck you want. If I could, everything I use would be open source because I'm cheap, first of all, but it also means that at the end of the day, when I'm using something, if I'm having trouble with it, I can crack it open and take a look. When something's not open source, we get used to this black box methodology where we're just calling functions left and right, and the only way to know if they're slow is to profile them. And at the end of the day, when you're learning, you want to know how something is accomplished. If something's not open source, you got no chance of knowing how, unless the person who made it is willing to explain it to you. Raylib is also multi-platform, and when I say that, I'm really talking Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, so all your desktop platforms. You can definitely put it on Raspberry Pi, but it's going to be up to you to make sure the program is optimized well, which, granted, with C, if you're building this in C, it's kind of uh, a given, but you still should be careful. It can also deploy to Android, which is very surprising, and we can also get web builds running with WebAssembly and embed it right into an HTML file. So very, very cool stuff. Especially for the 2D examples, it makes a lot of sense to be getting it running on web. As far as some of the more complicated stuff, you have to keep in mind you are limited to whatever the, the actual WebAssembly OpenGL layer is going to allow you, and I wouldn't be in a rush to put really crazy intensive projects on there. But definitely simple 2D projects, very easily you can deploy to web. So I find that it's actually really good if you're running a class or if you're writing a blog post about how you've coded something, you can basically code a little demo in Raylib and embed it right into your blog post, which is very cool. It is compatible with many languages through the use of community-driven bindings. And when I say this, what I mean is it is written in C for C99, which means anything after C99 you can use. So C, uh, C11, uh, I think there's actually like a C2008 or something. But it also means since C and C++ are so related, you can use it directly in C++, but beyond that, there are generated bindings for many languages, and we're going to get into some of those languages and when I say community-driven, what I mean by that and what that comes with. Raylib is perfect for experimenters who are looking at certain games and certain algorithms and saying, ah, you know, I want to play with that myself. So I actually posted a video very recently about the Papers, Please, Paper Stacking uh, visual effect that is present in Lucas Pope's Papers, Please. I absolutely love this game. And I thought this was actually a demo I did a long time ago and I thought it'd be fun to sort of redo it on camera about an hour and a half, I should say. It's a long video, maybe not the greatest tool for, for learning, but that's because every time I introduce a new concept, I take the time to sort of chat about it. In the future, I'll you know, go into more detail and they'll be broken up into smaller videos. So it's a little more digestible because having an hour and a half video, I don't think anybody's gonna watch it. Relive's also great for educators and learners. So. Uh, in the case of in the classroom, you know, like I took a programming class when I was in, uh, in high school, in the 11th grade, and we used a tool called Processing, which is a Java style programming language with an IDE debugger, everything built in. Very good for learning, but it's kind of heavyweight. And something about Raylib is being uh, open source, you know, Processing was open source as well, but being uh, open source in C... You know, C is a great language to learn first, I think. It's very foundational. Every language that came after it is very inspired by it. I think it's kind of like, th there's definitely languages, like spoken languages you can learn that make every other language easier to learn. 
I, I, I want to say it's like Mandarin, but I don't really know what the one is. But there's always a, sort of a, a central language, and I think that is C. So for a learner or an educator, teaching C is great. And using Raylib to do that is going to keep it fun and interesting because somebody in high school probably wants to try making a game. And if you can give them the power to do that while teaching them to code, I mean, coding is required to make a game. So why not use a graphics library so that they can actually get sprites on the screen, you know, and, and start playing around with learning some of the really challenging things like c collision and gravity, you know, physics, stuff like that. Getting somebody to implement those things from scratch is definitely a great way to learn. And Raylib is going to help you with that. You can use it to develop games and apps alike. I lean towards games because we are going to have that uh, OpenGL, um, we are going to have that OpenGL layer. So maybe some apps you don't really want to have running at OpenGL because it's going to be a bit of a waste uh, of processing power. But it's definitely a fun introduction. If you're familiar with Raylid, you can try making an app, and then uh, maybe sometime down the line you can switch to using a form framework like Lazarus or Windows Forms. You know, there's other things you can use uh, for that kind of stuff. Really, you can use Raylib for anything, is what I'm getting at. I mean, you could do whatever you want. At the end of the day, Raylib gives you a window and lets you draw things in it and it lets you play sound. So you can do a lot of stuff with that and it's gonna be up to you to, uh, to ultimately do that. It's kind of like how some people uh, make animations in Unity instead of games, you know what I mean? It's, it, you can kind of do whatever. It's up to you, it's how creative you are. Some things that Raylib are not, it's not a game engine, okay? A game engine is gonna have a lot more stuff. It's gonna have objects that have update behaviors and they're gonna have a bunch of renderers and animators. It's gonna have networking. It's gonna have all kinds of other stuff. It's gonna have an editor, which Raylib is not and doesn't have. Raylib doesn't have a dedicated IDE. It's also not an editor. It's, it's strictly, it's one library that you can use in many languages. But if we're really gonna go down the road of comparing Raylib to a game engine and an editor, then I may as well get this out of the way. It's not a cheeseburger and it's not an elephant. And the reason I say this is because a game engine and a graphics framework are completely separate ideologies. One of them is not better than the other because they fulfill an entirely different purpose. A graphics framework allows a programmer to skip the, the stuff about making the graphics code. And I'll explain that more later, but it allows you to basically, it gives you the tools to say, here, you can draw stuff, you can play sounds, now you can make a game. But you're gonna have to build some game engine code on top of Raylib. And that's the idea. Raylib is gonna handle the input output and then it's gonna be up to you to make that input output do something. To have the input affect the game state in a way and then have it render it in a way so that it looks pretty. But you don't have to actually communicate directly with OpenGL. It's gonna save you a lot of trouble that way. So just because it's not a game engine or editor doesn't mean it doesn't have tremendous value. As far as things it can't do, Raylib is entirely incapable of, there is nothing that it can't do because Raylib isn't doing anything. Raylib puts things on the screen and it tells you when somebody presses a button, you know, and it's got the keyboard, mouse, controller support. Raylib is gonna handle all that stuff for you. But if, as far as what it's capable of, it's up to you. So you need to write that code. Why would you use Raylib? Well, if you're making a game, it's a fun and foundational approach to game design where you're actually gonna have to be coding those systems on your own. If you've never coded any systems before, it's a great exercise. Um, it can be very challenging, but it gives you a lot of insight when you're building games as to what your game code is really doing at runtime. So, you know, when it comes to writing physics or when it comes to writing an, even an animator, you know, and that's actually a really fun tutorial that we'll have posted uh, not too long after this video goes out. And like I said before, it's kind of like building a game engine, but without the hassle of writing the graphics code where you're actually having to interface directly with OpenGL. Because that can be very tricky, a lot of tricky math there. There are plenty of language bindings for Raylib, so you could bring in other libraries from other languages that you're a little more familiar with and, and just get started right away. And it also means if you're familiar with Raylib because you've used it in one language and you want to learn a new language, you can use Raylib as the inspiration to that. So for example, I know Raylib in C and I'm very comfortable with it. And I'm also pretty comfortable with C Sharp. It'd be really fun to bring Raylib into C Sharp so that I can take advantage of that object-oriented approach and, and build more complicated structures. For apps, there's less of a focus on platform-specific code. Since Raylib is multi-platform, we're gonna have the ability to just kind of write the app and it'll, it'll just work. Whereas if you're gonna use something like Windows Forms, good luck putting that on Mac OS. So now you're gonna have to port all of that stuff. And if you're gonna use even something like WX Widgets, I think it has platform-specific code in uh, C++. So 
Uh, I personally wouldn't use it for apps, but it does have the benefit of since you're already running an OpenGL layer, you can have graphically intensive elements. So maybe you're making some kind of graphing software. In that case, it's definitely gonna be worthwhile to use something like Raylib. And actually Ray has some example apps on his website. So Raylib's bindings, this is the exciting thing. So it's got all the hits, right? C++, <laughs> C Sharp. Uh, it does have Python, Lua, Java, which are kind of the other things that I like to think about sometimes, the scripting focused languages. And then of course there's more, okay? There's way more. There are some duplicates, but they, they're different. The way that all these bindings are even possible, Raylib works for C and C++, and then beyond that, if you need anything else, you have to use a binding. Now it's possible to generate bindings, to, to write a program that is gonna look at Raylib and you know when it sees this pattern, replace it with that pattern so that the way the functions are defined, the return types, all those things can work in any language. So most of these bindings are actually generated and then people go in and touch them up after. Now, like I said, Ray doesn't make these, they're promoted by Ray and he's very proud to promote them. When it comes to using Raylib, there is very little boilerplate. This is something that I really like. So this is a basic minimal program in Raylib. So here's the width and here's the height and then the title of the window. Then we have a while loop. This is our game loop. You have to remember that uh, when you're building a game, there is like code is being repeatedly called. So everything we put in this loop is gonna be repeatedly called until the window closes. And this function right here, window should close. It's gonna continuously return false until we press escape or for some other reason the window should close, at which point it will return true and then this loop will break. Inside the loop, there's no update logic because all this example does is print a message to the screen. So if you had update logic, you would put it before this begin drawing. And then everything between begin drawing and end drawing should be a drawing function. So obviously we have draw text, but as we'll see uh, shortly, Raylib has a lot more uh, drawing things that we can use. So very simple boilerplate, which I really like. Now to get it set up on Windows, it's really, really simple. I'm not gonna walk through the process. I'm showing this list and then I'll show screenshots, but I don't wanna reinstall Raylib on my computer just because, uh, that, you know, there's no point in you watching me run the installer. You know, it's, it's not very long, but it's not gonna teach you anything by watching a bar move. So it's only seven steps and that's really including testing it. So you go to his website, there's a link to the GitHub repo where you can download the latest release he actually provides an installer, which is gonna give you all of the programs, all the commands you need on your computer to be able to run. So if you've never done any development before, this will get you a, a C compiler, a copy of Make, and a bunch of other things that you need to be able to uh, compile and run code on a Windows machine. Once you've run the installer, it's gonna actually add a new program to your computer, which is called Notepad++ for Raylib. I mentioned that Raylib doesn't have an IDE, and it doesn't use an ID of any kind. However, for your convenience, Ray has included a modified version of Notepad++ that enables you to basically press a button and compile the game, which is very cool. Uh, and it has a little bit of autocomplete. It's not the greatest thing in the world, but it'll get you, you get your feet off the ground anyway. So once you've opened Notepad++, uh, we're gonna open an example project and we're gonna compile it and run it to make sure that everything's working. So first, you're gonna actually go to raylib.com and in the top right corner, there is a little GitHub icon. So we're gonna actually choose that. That's gonna take us to his GitHub repo. Now on the far right side, um, on, if you never used GitHub before, on the far right side is a sidebar. And if you scroll down, you'll see a releases option. So just click on the big green latest and that's gonna take us to a page that shows you know, it's got, it's got a little post explaining what's new in the new release. So if you scroll down, there's an assets list and you can choose the Raylib installer. Now we want the one that says M-I-N-G-W, you know, min -G -W, I say min -G -W. Um, The version number might vary if you're watching this in the future and there's a newer version than 4.0. Um, it doesn't matter what version you get because I don't think Ray is in the interest of fundamentally changing how all of this works. So the updates are usually fairly incremental. It's usually about adding stuff. And when he does rename functions, he'll add defines that actually create an alias. So if he changes it from text format to format text, he'll make it so both work, which is very, very cool. So download this installer, actually run it, just be a very simple, you know, next, next, yes, yes, checkbox, everything. And then when you're finished, you're gonna wanna open Notepad++ for Raylib. So you can search for it in the start menu, or you can actually go to see Raylib MPP on your Windows machine 
and that will take you to the Notepad++ folder and you'll see the executable in there. Uh, so run Notepad++ for Raylib. And next we're gonna wanna actually find the example that we're gonna compile and run. So if you go to C Raylib Raylib, then there'll be an examples folder. In examples is a core folder and in core is a core basic window.c. This is the file we wanna open in the Raylib Notepad++ editor. So I would say open Raylib for Notepad++, then open this file and your computer should know to open it in the Raylib modified version because it's the one that's already open. If you open it without opening that first, it might open it in the normal Notepad++, which is fine, but we're not gonna be able to compile it very easily. So it's best to open it that way. Once you've opened the file, if you press F6, you're gonna get this pop-up. This is a pop-up from NPP exec, which is a plugin that is automatically downloaded to this version of Notepad++ that basically makes it so we can press a button and execute some arbitrary code. That arbitrary code here is the Raylib compile execute script. So you're gonna actually wanna make sure when you pop up this window that you choose that dropdown and make sure Raylib compile execute is chosen. The other options here, basic C compilation are just to compile a regular C program without Raylib. Then there's the Raylib make file and Raylib source compile. So these are actually used for generating Raylib. So when we run the installer, it's gonna actually generate the Raylib files for us. But if we don't do that, you know, if Raylib gets updated, we can download the source code and manually compile Raylib ourselves. It's a little bit advanced and not really necessary for what we're doing. So I'm not gonna worry too much about it. There's also a resource file compilation. So when you build a game, typically you don't distribute the files for the game that actually have the sound effects and the pictures. Typically you're gonna compile those into a binary format, which is going to sometimes help with compression, sometimes actually create a problem where the files feel bigger. But at the end of the day, it's gonna protect those files from being modified or stolen. So if you have a licensed file in your program and you don't want somebody to steal it and use it in their game, typically when you, turns it, when you turn it into ones and zeros, it's harder to steal. So that's the idea. Once you hit that and hit okay, you're gonna see the Raylib basic menu pop up and we know that Raylib is working. Okay, let's try it out for ourselves. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is we're actually going to find Notepad++. So here I've got uh, my Notepad++. As I was saying, if you can't find it, um, you can always type in C, Raylib, Raylib. And this is like, this is where Raylib actually is on your computer. So you can see, if you go into source, you can actually see all of the source code for how Raylib actually works. But we don't want the code. We wanna go back to the main Raylib folder and there is an NPP folder. And then down here is Notepad++ for Raylib. So if you can't find it in the start menu, you can always run it from here, but it should be in your start menu just fine. So I like to create a projects folder in here where I can actually put my projects that I'm actually working on. Um, but we're not gonna worry too much about that. We're gonna open the example. So if I go back to Raylib, go in here again, there is an examples folder as I was showing, and there is a core folder. And if we scroll down, there should be a core basic window.c. So if I drag this in here, then I can see the core basic window, there's a little comment with a lovely message from Ray. And then we can see here, so it looks a little different from the screenshot I showed, it's because in my screenshot, I've removed the comments and I simplified some of the variables. But you can see generally this is a good idea to have a screen width and height variable because in your code, you might wanna put something in the middle and instead of having to copy paste the number 800 everywhere, you can say screen width by two, for example. So here's the code. I'm not gonna to worry too much about what's here because we're gonna end up writing our own in a minute, but let's press F6 and let's actually hit okay because I'm on compile execute. And there we go, there's my first window. Very cool. So now we're gonna to want to actually create our own file. Of course, you can just go ahead and, uh, you can just go ahead and modify this file. There's no reason not to, but I always like to start from scratch when I can. I'm gonna have a new file. And the first thing I'm gonna do is hit save as so that I can make sure I'm saving the file correctly. And I'm gonna to go to that folder I was just in and I'm just gonna call it main.c. You don't have to call it main.c, but it does have to end with .c, <laughs> okay? Now I'm gonna operate under the assumption that you are at least, uh, roughly familiar with uh, C. So I'm not gonna be explaining kind of what I'm doing as I go here. I'm more focused on explaining 
what we're doing with Rayleb and just showing off some of the simple things we can do. If you're making a, a much larger project, it might be worthwhile to try looking at some uh, more powerful IDEs and maybe even something like uh, VS Code or something. Okay, so if I press F6, we should get almost the same window just without the text. Okay, very cool. We've got the basic window. So we're gonna start with textures. That's the big thing. Well, I guess I can start with total primitives. So we can actually just draw a rectangle. We'll give a position, how about 100, 100, and we'll make it 100 by 100. I'll just say blue and hit F6, and we should see it's near the top left corner. Cool, there's our square. Now in typical C fashion, we can have a position X, which is equal to zero. And in my update here, before I draw it, I'm just going to increment that and we'll put that here instead. And if I hit F6, we'll see it'll move pretty fast because I'm not setting a target frame rate. It's set target FPS, yep. Let's set it to about 24, just so we can see the square move a little slower. Typically, I like to use 144 because I am a gamer. Of course, you can increase it more. And then aside from using an int, we can also use a float position x. And instead of incrementing like this, we have a very important function in game design, which is get frame time. So this will move one pixel every second, which is pretty rough. So we can multiply that to say we'll move 100 pixels per second. And there we go, 100 pixels per second. So let's get a texture instead. So I've got a, picked out a couple uh, assets here. I've got a Kenny sprite, and I've also got a sound effect and a music file, and we're gonna be able to play all of these. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy all of these into my folder. Within this folder, I need to know that these are the names, sound, sprite, and music. And each one is a different file type. So sound effects, you want to be OGG, music files should be an MP3, and then sprite uh, should be a PNG. Okay, enough chit chat, let's get a texture. So Raylib has a struct called a texture 2D. I'll call it a sprite. And after we've initialized the window, this has to come after because init window creates the OpenGL graphics context. And to load a sprite, we're actually loading it right to the graphics card. So I need to make sure I call this after. So we will say sprite is equal to load texture. And I just have to put the name, path to the file, which is sprite.png. Once I've loaded the texture in draw, I can simply say draw texture. We need to give a texture itself, so I'll put sprite. Then I need to give the X and Y position and a tint. So for the X and Y position, I'll do 100 and 100. And for the tint, I'll just do white. I'm actually gonna bring it in a little bit. Just 10 by 10. Okay, let's compile and run. There's our sprite. We got our little stone dude. And just as before, it wouldn't be much for me to create a position. I'm just going to make it so that if he goes off the screen, he'll move back because he's going to be moving pretty quick here. Okay. Instead of using this negative 100, I can actually define this float position X after we load the texture. he is fully obscured. So he's fully on the right and then he's fully on the left. So it's a nice smooth loop. Okay, we got our sprite loaded and he's moving. That's great. Now let's get some sound. So my sound effect is sound.ogg. I'm gonna add a sound effect. So when we click the screen and update, I'm gonna say if is mouse button pressed. This is one of our input functions. We need to specify a uh, button, mouse button left. So if we press the left mouse button, then we're gonna just say play sound, sound. Really straightforward. I have no idea how loud this is gonna be, so brace yourself. Forgot a really important step. After we initialize the window, we're gonna init the audio device. And before we close the window, we're gonna close the audio device. The reason this is like this is because, like I said, if you have a different sound library that you want to use, go for it. Raylib is not going to waste the overhead of creating an audio context if you're not going to use it. Very loud. 
playing around with the mixer to make it less brutal for you. There we go. Just for fun, let's make it so that it only plays that sound if I actually click on the guy. Because right now, I can click anywhere and it'll do it. So we're going to say check collision point rectangle. What the heck? So this takes two parameters. We need a point and a rectangle. So the point is going to be get mouse position. And then we need a rectangle. And the way we define a rectangle is like this. Rectangle, call it sprite rect, which is equal to, and it takes four parts. It takes the x, the y, the width and height. So the x is position x, which is changing every frame, of course, which is why it's important that we do this in the while loop. Then we need the y position, which is 10. Now the width comes from sprite width and the height comes from sprite height. So that is the rectangle that describes the sprite. So I can just put sprite rect in here. So when we press left mouse button, if the mouse is in the sprite rect, play sound. This probably doesn't cost a lot of cycles to create this rectangle and it doesn't take a lot of RAM, but just for the sake of being smart, we only need to compute this rectangle if we've pressed the left mouse button. So on frames where we haven't done this, we're not gonna worry about that. And just another important thing, I'm actually gonna move the code that drives the sprite forward before we do this logic because I think it'll just make a little more sense for the collision. Okay, let's run it. Clicking does nothing unless it's on the guy. Now, just a quick thing to keep in mind. Uh, so if the position of this sprite is position X10, let's just draw a circle at that point with a small radius and we'll make it green just so we can see where the center is and what you'll find is that that's actually the top left corner of the sprite so if you ever need the middle of a sprite you're going to want to offset it by the width and height uh, by two so that's one thing you have to keep in mind i'll get rid of this draw circle i don't need it so much that's our sound lastly we got to get music music dot make sure to actually create all the names are very simple and very easy to remember because we've already initialized the audio device i don't have to worry about it i am going to load the music stream and then i'm going to take an extra step to actually play the music stream oops i don't want to specify the string i want to give the actual object so we'll make sure we start the music playing and then in every frame i need to actually update the music stream because uh, if you're not familiar with the idea of streaming, basically the gist is instead of loading the entire file, we're loading a reference to the file. And as the music plays, um, we're basically scanning across the file. So it's just a little bit more efficient that way. And something we don't have to do, but it's not a bad idea, is to actually stop the music stream when it's time to close the game. Because remember, everything after this loop is like after the window closes. Cool. Just to demonstrate a few more concepts here, input concepts, we can say is key pressed. So this will return true on the frame that the key is pressed. Um, so we can see if the key uh, space is pressed. And if that's true, then we will actually play the music stream. But first we will stop the music stream. So if you call stop music stream when it's not playing, it's not gonna hurt anybody. But basically what that's gonna do is instead of starting music right away, it's gonna start when I press space. And if I press it, it'll restart. So you'll notice a few things uh, about the sound. I can only play one sound at a time. Uh, aside from just playing sound, there's actually a better function for that. So if we look at play sound, there is play sound multi using a multi-channel buffer pool. So instead, we can actually overlay the sound multiple times. But, you know, use at your own risk. Um, obviously, play sound wouldn't get you very far in, in, uh, in like a game, 
because that means only one sound can ever play at a time. Probably you're gonna want a few channels as far as the tour goes. We've shown off having a sprite, we've done a little bit of input, we've got some music and some sound. So this is a pretty uh, simple code. I will provide the source code. There's a lot more you can do with textures, sounds, music, and I'm gonna explore all of that in separate videos. So if you're interested in learning more about Raylib and you're interested in actually uh, checking out what is really possible with Raylib, then I would highly recommend subscribing to this channel. I'll be posting a bunch of Raylib content over the next little while. And if you absolutely can't wait, go to Raylib.com. You can check out some examples and be sure to thank Ray for making this fantastic library. Take care.